Well, it's that time of year, and lots of familiar things are happening that happen this time of year. And one of those things for a pastor is, okay, I need to preach some Christmas messages. Um, are there some that I've preached before that I could preach again? Are they good enough to preach again? Dr. R.G. Lee said if a sermon is not worth preaching twice, it wasn't worth preaching the first time. Uh, but also, the thought comes, well, I, is there something fresh? And I, I do want to tell you that this morning, I pray this will be fresh, but some of you have heard this. But over the next uh, Sundays, our choir is going to make a presentation, and I'll have a word then as well. But I want to bring to you two new messages, um, one on the gospel babe, that'll be the title, and then uh, the other uh, out of uh, Micah, and we're going to talk about the one who was promised, and I'll give you more about that in the coming weeks. But for this morning, find Isaiah 6, and let me tell you that another thing that happens that's already begun to happen is that people sing Christmas carols, the radio plays Christmas carols, places of business play Christmas carols. And the sermon today is not about Christmas carols, but I want to tell you, if you can deny the truths presented today, you can effectively wipe out many of the songs we sing, or at least as some even ecclesiastical bodies have done, you may rewrite the lyrics. I found this article out of the UK, the Balderized song, that means censored, which replaces joy to the world, the Lord is come, let earth receive her king with the lines, joy to the world for peace shall come, let this be our refrain. It came out, top of a poll hosted by Ship of Fools, the religious humor website. Other Christmas favorites altered for the politically correct age include O Come All Ye Faithful, with some congregations told to sing O Come in Adoration instead of O Come Let Us Adore Him, which is apparently considered too gender specific. When I speak of these altered Christmas carols, I'm not talking about like... Um, uh, Frosty the snow person. I'm not talking about altering, but those, but the ones of faith. Hark the herald angels sing has also been updated with the line, glory to the Christ child bring, deemed more inclusive than glory to the newborn king. And I also found on a website, when you Googled Hark the herald angels sing and you found a lyric, lyrical website, it literally s talked about the favored one instead of the virgin in the second verse. They've even tried to take the virgin birth out of Hark the Herald Angels Sing. We could read, I could read further on this, but this time of year, a lot of familiar things happen, as I've said. But we don't need to take these familiar things for granted. We don't need to lose our worship and the title of my message today is worshiping the supernatural savior worshiping the supernatural savior now be let's be clear i don't want us to be guilty of worshiping the occasion some people worship the occasion everything has to be just right or they can't worship some people choose a church that way everything's got to be just right or they can't worship and it's no wonder they go from church to church to church to church, drop out of church. But our faith is not in faith. Someone might be asked who has had some trauma in his life or her life. How did you get through 2017? They might respond, my faith. My faith has gotten me through. But that will only be correct if 
The object of their faith is the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you realize people have always gotten nervous about the worship of Jesus? Herod got nervous, the Pharisees got nervous, and the atheists today hate this time of year. I don't know why they want to wreck our holiday where we celebrate the birth of Christ we're not trying to change their holiday, which is April 1st. Amen? Because the Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. This morning, I have no other task than to call you to know more about Jesus and to worship him. Now, so many people will say, we need to not simply know more about Jesus but we need to know Jesus in a personal relationship. You're right. That's right. But if our culture doesn't get to know more about him, they'll never, never be able to know him. But besides, you know, Jesus is always trying to reveal himself to us. We need to think about that at Christmas. Jesus is, he, he, he's come out of heaven. He didn't have to come out of heaven. And he became a man. He's always now trying to reveal himself. The Bible says he's the light that lights every man who comes into the world. He wants to come into your life today if you've never invited him. But read with me this first verse today, Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin. By the way, your translation may say a virgin, virgin, and the Hebrew definite article is definitely there in the manuscripts. It's the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel or God with us. The virgin birth. I want to call us this season to worship the one who had a supernatural birth. But hey, there have been many supernatural births. So we might want to say a one-of-a-kind supernatural birth. Because Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, had a supernatural birth because his parents were aged. The, one of the first types of Christ... Isaac, his birth was supernatural. His parents, Abraham and Sarah, they were well advanced in years. Sarah over 90 years old. That was a supernatural birth. But only Jesus' birth is a virginal conception and birth. By the way, if you have a study Bible especially if you have a translation known as the Revised Standard Version or the New Revised Standard Version, you'll notice that it doesn't say virgin, it says young maid or young woman. Now, the Hebrew word Alma can be translated young maid or young woman, but their footnotes would indicate that had Isaiah meant to say a woman who had never known a man, that he would have used the Hebrew Bethulma. But Bethulma is used of wicked cities in, another, in, in other places in the Old Testament. Besides this, in Genesis 24, 43, we read, Behold, I stand by the well of water, and it shall come to pass that when the virgin comes out to draw water, the Alma and I say to her, please give me a little water from your pitcher to drink. And of course, we're talking about Isaac and Rebekah. The word is best translated virgin. To remove all doubt, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Matthew, writing in common Greek, uses the Greek word that can only be translated virgin, as in a woman who has never known a man, when he translates this verse from Hebrew to Greek, and he says, Behold, the 
virgin, the Parthenos, shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And before that, Matthew said, So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. You see, God was speaking through Isaiah. And yes, the context was that there was a king, Ahaz, that he was not who he should have been. And he was not trusting in the Lord. And there were neighboring nations that were threatening the nation, God's people. And there would be a, a child born, probably to Isaiah, named Masher Shalahashbaz. How would you like to have a name like that? But because it's the virgin. And because the ultimate deliverance for God's people is not a child of Isaiah, but the son of the living God, I personally believe that Isaiah 7.14 is not a prophecy about simply a baby that would have been born then. And I really don't even believe so much that verse 14 itself is a dual prophecy that refers to both, although there are many good scholars that believe that. But I believe God, through the prophet Isaiah, was stepping in and alerting them to the fact that one day Jesus is coming and this will be a sign to you because the virgin will conceive and bring forth a son. By the way, this supernatural, virginal conception and birth means that Jesus, Jesus is not a son of Adam. You know the worst thing I could say about any of you and the most truthful thing I could say about any of you is that you are sons and daughters of Adam. <laughs> and I am as well. And the Bible says, in Adam all die. And in the book of Romans, the fifth chapter, uh, we can read, I want to just read a couple of verses that would point to what theologians call the doctrine of original sin. And in verse 12, Paul writes, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. That is, we know this has infected everyone because all have chosen to sin. So we're sinners by nature because we're sons and daughters of Adam. And we're sinners by choice. We've chosen to do what's in our nature. Verse 14, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. So even in his sin, Adam was a type of Christ. That means he was a picture you say, well, that doesn't sound very good because you just said, preacher, one of the worst things you could say about us is that we're sons and daughters of Adam. Yes, I know, but here's what Paul means. Adam was a type of him to come in that Adam was a federal representative head of the human race. In other words, all of us related to Adam, we are, we are all affected by what he did. But just like that, all of us who've been reborn, and now we are not, we are sons and daughters in Adam in our old nature. And we can trace back to Adam, but now we're not spiritually in the sphere or the domain of Adam. Praise God, if we know Jesus, we're not in Adam, but we're in the second Adam, the Bible says, which is Christ. Verse 17, for if the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in the life through the one Jesus Christ. That's how Adam was a picture of Christ because he was the one and Christ has become the one and because of the virgin birth, now some people say, well, there's no exact scripture that tells us that the virgin birth is all that important at all. I had a professor in college tell me that. And I, he would say there's no Pauline attestation to the virgin birth. That means there's no scripture that Paul wrote that refers to the virgin birth. But I tell you what, uh, I, Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 uh, gets awfully close to me uh, because I'm going to read it to you. Here's what Paul wrote. 
But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. I believe that implies that Jesus was virgin born. See, if we have a problem with the virgin birth, we instantly have ruined Christmas in many different ways. First of all, that young lady that you see in the manger scene, loose, loose. Joseph knew he wasn't the father. He was about to divorce her. You've got a deep problem with the character of Mary if you have a problem with the virgin birth. Not only that, you've got a problem with the character of Jesus because you're saying that he has inherited the same nature that you inherited, that he is an Adam and in Adam all die. But really, if you have a problem with the virgin birth, your problem is with your own character because you're doubting the word of God. The word of God is clear that Jesus was born of a virgin. The word of God is clear that any time there is a new birth or there is a spiritual birth, incorruptible seed is used. And so 1 Peter 1.23, For the spiritual birth, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Mary was with child because the Holy Spirit in a mysterious, miraculous way, put Jesus, God incarnate, God in human flesh, in her womb. Can you imagine that? The embryonic Jesus, right there, in Mary's womb. And then, just like any other baby, because he was 100% human as if he were not God at all, even though he was 100% God as if he were not human at all, that baby became our supernatural Savior. Let us worship our supernatural Savior, the one who had a supernatural birth. Let us worship our supernatural Savior, the one who had a supernatural life. Look over at Isaiah 9 with me. Isaiah 9 Verse 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Why am I saying who he has a supernatural life? Well, Isaiah 9, 6 even alludes back to his birth. Look at the first two phrases. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. A child of, is born speaks of his absolute humanity. A, a, a son is given speaks of his deity. And theologians have debated the nature of Christ for many years, but I want to tell you that right off the bat, just in the first 100 years after Christ, there were those that would say that Jesus was, was God, but he really wasn't man. He was sort of a, a phantom walking around. Th these were Gnostics. Then others said, well, he, he really was just a man. And these were followers of a man named Arius. And so today you might hear someone's an Arian. That may refer to someone who's a racist, but originally it referred to someone who denied the deity of Jesus Christ. By the way, if you deny the virgin birth, you're going to have to deny this one. I'm just going to tell you. And by the way, there are some things on which good, godly people can disagree. Should we have the Lord's Supper table up here, or steps. Should we, uh, we could even disagree, should we baptize by immersion, or should we sprinkle? We could disagree on that and still be considered Christians. 
Uh, should we, uh, you know, should we sing three songs or four songs? But let me tell you, you can't be saved and deny the deity of Jesus Christ because Jesus, all through the Gospels, had very choice words to say to those who did not believe he was God. And he never corrected those who called him God and who fell at their feet and worshipped him. He never corrected them, but blessed them and received their worship. He is God. By the way, in John chapter 1, we read, In the beginning was the Word. That is the, the word logos. It means an expression or word of, a, of an idea or a, of, an, of a reality. In the beginning was the expression, was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. And He is the light, and that life is the li- and that li- He is the life, and that life is the light of men. And the darkness has not overcome or comprehended the light. And that word, verse 14, became flesh and dwelt among us. There's the, there's the, the transaction. There's the incarnation. There's the virginal conception and birth. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father. There's the virgin birth. He's from the Father. He's begotten. He's in first place. Doesn't mean he was created full of grace and truth. He came because of the grace of God and he was the embodiment and is the embodiment of the truth of God. This is the supernatural life of Jesus. He, the author of Hebrews says, was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. The author of Philippians, the Apostle Paul, explained it this way. He said, Who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. In other words, he he didn't consider it something he had to steal away from God or hold on to and clutch, but he made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to the death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him. I love this verse. And given him a name that is above every name, that at that name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. For unto us a child is born, unto us a child. A son is given. But what about that next phrase? And the government will be upon his shoulder. Well, again, as I back up to give you some context, the government in Isaiah's day was in the shambles. And God was judging a nation who had committed spiritual adultery. And the, and the God of the universe, who's called a people out for his namesake, a people who have not kept the covenant they have made with God, but nevertheless, a people from whom God will bring this Messiah, this supernatural one, Isaiah, God through Isaiah is telling them there's going to come one. He's not going to be like your wicked king who's got these secret alliances with those in the north, but the whole government will be upon his shoulders. I've got news for some of these politicians and some of these college professors and some of these people at the United Nations. We Bible-believing conservative Christians, we're not against a one-world government, a one-world order. No, we're not, as long as Jesus is at the head, amen, because that's what it's headed to. Because the kingdoms of this world, Revelation 11, 5, are going to become the kingdoms of our God and His Christ. The government shall be upon His shoulder. He's going to rule and reign. Everything is going to be built upon Jesus. 
And then he's wonderful. I like, uh, I believe it's more accurate to not say wonderful counselor, like a great counselor, but wonderful, comma, counselor, comma. Wonderful means he's beyond our total comprehension. He's supernatural. Counselor, he's the source of all wisdom. And mighty God, he's all-powerful. He's omnipotent. He's not a sub-God or just a created being. He's not created at all. But he is, in fact, part of the Trinity. He is the creator. And then he's the everlasting Father. He's our heavenly Father. He's the Prince of Peace. Jesus alone can bring peace. People are worried about peace in the Middle East. It proves this. The one thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. Amen? That's what all that proves because there's never been any lasting peace. Never shall there be until the Prince of Peace sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives and defeats the armies of Antichrist. He is the Prince of Peace. And not only peace on the earth, but the peace that comes instantaneously, the peace that we can have now is the peace between us and God. You, you see, Christmas is not about feeling good. Christmas is not about, well, maybe I should worship God on this special day. Christmas is about the fact that there was a major problem and the problem was that we had fallen into sin and God cannot look upon sin and there is conflict, enmity, warfare between God and man and the Bible says the soul that sins shall surely die and the Bible says I will by no means clear the guilty and the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and yet Jesus has come to establish peace because his death alone will establish peace between us and God. Which brings me to my last point. May we worship the supernatural Savior who had a super supernatural birth, virginal conception and birth. May we worship Him who has a supernatural life. And finally, may we worship our supernatural Savior because what He did and what he does today is a supernatural work. He is the one who performs a supernatural work. Isaiah 53, turn over there with me. Let's back up to verse 5. Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace, see there's the peace, was upon him, do you get that? He was punished so that we could have peace with God. And his, by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What is the supernatural work? Well, it was prophesied some 600 years before Matthew would write. In Matthew chapter 1, he will save his people from their sins. Because this virgin's going to bring forth a son, and his name is going to be Jesus. Yahweh saves. That's what Jesus means. Yeshua! Joshua, Yahweh saves. Yahweh saves. And where did this happen? Well, it happened at the cross. Because as you read Isaiah 53, you read that this was a brutal death that the Messiah was to die. And it happened at the cross. Some people stumble at the cross. They call it barbaric religion. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I want you to think, as we draw towards a close in a moment, of this supernatural work. Jesus came 
to his 33rd birthday and passed it, he had never sinned one time. I had an elementary school principal that I used to pastor, and one day she was teaching some college kids in Sunday school. Uh, and I was sort of teaching along with her, and I asked this question, did Jesus ever sin? And she said, well, sure, when he got separated from his parents. <laughs> the Bible doesn't teach that that was a sin. That was not a sin. Jesus was about his father's business. How can you sin if you're doing exactly as a child what your father wants you to do? <laughs> you can't. Jesus was betrayed. Jesus was falsely accused. Jesus was beaten. Jesus was mocked. Jesus was spat upon. Jesus' brow was pierced with a crown of thorns. Jesus was hung on a cross to die. And he died. And it was just no ordinary death. Because when he died, the sins of the world were distilled upon him. And the Lord hath laid on him, verse 6, the iniquity of us all. Let me tell you a story. Father and son were going to go fishing. Little boy had a new puppy. He said, Dad, we're going to take the puppy, aren't we? No, son, the puppy doesn't need to come. No. Well, but finally, after enough begging, the father said, okay, and the boy was able to bring the puppy. They had a little aluminum fishing boat. They went out. That puppy did what puppies do. It was getting in the fishing line. He was scratching. Son, keep the puppy still. I mean all morning. Keep the puppy. Son, stop. You've got to keep your dog still. Finally, in a fit of rage... This cruel father takes a little hatchet out of his tackle box. Cuts off each paw on the gunwale of the boat as he flops the puppy's leg over the boat. Cuts off each paw of that little puppy and throws it out in the lake to drown. You say, Pastor, that's a terrible, terrible story. Yeah, it is. I don't even think it's true. But the audience always gasps a little more and gets a little quieter at that story than the story of my Jesus and his love. Which is true because those pure hands were nailed to that cross for you and me. And that pure heart in which there was never guile was broken in two for you and for me and Jesus died the death of every man and suffered the hell of every man and woman and boy and girl so he could supernaturally birth us into his kingdom so that we might be his adopted brothers Romans 8 so that we might be called the sons and daughters of God God help us not to be too familiar with the familiar things that happen this time of year. Let me just ask you, what is the greatest miracle? You say the resurrection of Jesus. Yes, I'm going to agree with you, but besides that, what's the greatest miracle? You might say, well, it's one that I've seen. I, I saw someone healed of cancer, Pastor. Let me ask you this. Have you ever seen uh, someone who had a, a, a withered limb, it grow back. Anybody? Raise your hand. You've seen that? Anybody? I, I didn't think so. But what about someone who was paralyzed from birth? Get up and walk. Have, has, anyone, has anyone seen that? Paralyzed from birth? You have. Wow. 
That's rare. I believe it can happen, but that's rare. Paralyzed from birth, get up and walk. In Matthew 9, Jesus looked at a man who was paralyzed from birth. And he said, your sins are forgiven you. And man, the Pharisees did not like that. They blasphemed. And they said only God can forgive sins. Well, that's true. They were right. And Jesus said, what do you think is greater? That I tell him his sins are forgiven or that he get up and walk? But so that you will believe that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, I say to this man, arise, get up and walk. And he got up and he walked. The point Jesus was making was, look, I can do both, but let me tell you the greatest thing is when I forgive sins. I forgive sins. That's the greatest miracle. So how would we translate into that, into our experience here 2,000 years beyond Bethlehem and Calvary? How, how would we interject that greatest miracle here? Would we say, well, he doesn't do that anymore? No, we wouldn't say that. But what we would say is the greatest miracle of all is salvation. It's salvation. It's when a person understands who Jesus is. And they understand what he's done for them. Their eyes are opened. And they realize that they are inept to do anything to cause God to love them any more or to earn or work their way towards heaven. But they realize that Jesus has done it all by becoming the object of God's wrath, their very sin. And in repentance and faith, they give their lives to Jesus. That is the greatest miracle. That is the greatest supernatural act that can happen, period, And by the way, I wanted to give you this word. Jesus is still in the soul-saving business. Let me just close with a very familiar illustration, especially to those who have had a little class that I teach sometimes here at the church. It's called a record book of your life. It's not original with me. I've modified it a little, but... uh, a very evangelistic, conservative Presbyterian preacher by the name of D. James Kennedy. I believe this is original with him, although if he were living today, he might say he got it somewhere. But here it is. Here's my birth certificate. May 9th, 1976, Ashley Edward Ray. And here's my, my death certificate. It's blank. I'm still here. And this is a record book. I mean, there's my first step. There's when I started eating with a fork. I I mean, everything's in here. Every thought, every word, every deed. Ooh, I wouldn't want you to see that one. There's quite a few in here I would rather you not read about. Every good, bad, and ugly thing. Every thought, every word, every deed. And the Bible tells me that in Adam, my sin separates me from God. So pretend this is me and and this is God. And there's separation there. Isaiah 59, 2. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you that he will not hear. But pretend this is Jesus Christ on the cross. And pretend this is your book. And pretend... even maybe that it's someone else's book. Pretend it's the worst person in the world's book. Pretend that like every other word is recording a sin that they've committed. This is the worst person. But the Bible says all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. By the way, that's a great definition for sin right there. Turning to your own way. And the Lord has laid on him 
meaning Jesus Christ, the iniquity or the sin of us all. Now that my sin is on Jesus, what keeps me from having a relationship with my Creator? And the answer is absolutely nothing. That can be yours today. How do I get that, Pastor? How, how can that happen? Well, if you have never been saved, if you have become through this message convinced that you're in need of that greatest of all miracles, you can just receive it. The Bible says in John 1, 12, to as many as received him, to them he gave the authority to become the children of God to those that believe in his name. The Bible says you can't earn it. It's grace. That, that means it's unearned. For by grace are you saved. You, you have to trust what Jesus did on the cross, that supernatural event of his death, his burial, and resurrection over 2,000 years ago. That's faith. For by grace have you been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I want to help you to do that right now. Maybe you've even been here. Maybe you've been... I don't know how God has... This is a great thing about just preaching the Bible. I, I don't know your needs. And even if you told me, you don't know all your needs. So I just preach the Bible because... I know every need will be met if I preach all the Bible and I know that God knows your needs. But, but, but here's, here's what I'm driving at. I don't know what you're experiencing. I don't know how God has been intervening to draw you to himself. But maybe today is the day. Maybe everything is coming to a head today. And today is your day of salvation. Here's how that would happen it's not a ritual. It's not joining the church. It's not baptism. All those things are important. It's not taking the Lord's Supper. It's faith alone in Christ alone. And you can't have faith unless you really realize that you need forgiveness. And that's repentance. That's, Lord, I, I need to turn to you. I need to turn away from being my own master and I need to turn to you. And so that looks like this. God, I'm, I'm so sorry for my sin. I want to turn my life over to you. I believe you, Jesus, died for me on the cross and paid for my sin. Would you save me, forgive me, come into my life, make me a child of God? Friends, thank you for joining us today here on the program. The Bible teaches that when God's Word goes out, it doesn't return empty. It accomplishes what He wants it to accomplish. And the Holy Spirit uses that to draw us to Christ. Do you know Christ? The Bible teaches that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Would you respond to the Word of God today? Would you respond to the drawing of the Holy Spirit? Just reach out to Him by faith in your heart, trusting that what He did on the cross is enough to save you. Just pray, Jesus, what you did on the cross, I want that applied to my life. Jesus, save me, forgive me, make me a new person. Amen. If you trusted Christ, we want to hear about it. Would you contact us? via the information on the screen. We'll also be glad to send you a new booklet that I've written, Following Jesus in Memphis. And until next time, may God bless you and may His Word be light for your living.